Greetings, you've reached the DFW Leader Online Ministry Fellowship. This is your host, Tevo D'Arcy, De and we're going to talk from a servant leader point of view, and it's going to be about pioneering ministry to pioneering ministers of all ages and sizes and races, and we submit it to you respectfully to the born-again community uh, in the body of Christ. And I'm going to just share what the Lord has put in my heart today, the state of the onion, and looking at the different levels and layers that continue to make our representation of, of Jesus Christ on this earth, his church, his salvation, either a thing to be wondered and amazed or followed or to be um, criticized at its worst. So this is a submitted non-dogmatic or feeling. I'm doing this with John 3.17 through Paul to do you as best I can with negotiation. We're putting up our symbols today for the talk, and this part is about the part that's directed at it's no longer a seller's market of an abandoned believer planning a ministry for many decades when I knew Jesus the Lord of my life at age 69 before I to college. And I honor my mother and father, who had been such a great portrayal of the ego-free, true servant leadership of Christian ministry. They were pastoring nondescript churches when I was growing up, but it was always a happy home, fun-loving, and they never brought the serious problems home with them. We instead had a happy childhood, my sister and I, an extended family of born-again believers, each one coming down from basically Southern Baptist, Methodist, and Presbyterian. There was no charismatic, no Pentecostal. I didn't know any. And so there was still, looking back in hindsight, everyone was still trying to hear God, trying to hear from God, pray, be led by the inward witness, the still small voice, and make decisions based on prayer and the Bible. So there was no lingo, dogma, to get confused about. And then my parents also, with my father, head of home, there was no legalism and law about what a male or a female, a female child could or could not become or do. And I remember my mother's family was like that. The men were business and leadership and the women had ministries, but my father was the, the pastor. My mother was not even called a pastor herself. It was a pastor's wife, which is traditional Southern Baptist. But she was a strong lady, and my father was proud of a capable woman. And they married, as I, in hindsight, not based on domination or control or legalism or law or thou shalt nots uh, of gender oppression, but instead it was Ephesians 5.21, mutual respect, mutual submission in the fear of the Lord. And I, I really mean that in the holy fear of the Lord, a fun-loving, carefree, basically, but respectful, abiding fear of the Lord, perception of others, boundaries of others, leaders' boundaries, respect for the children, respect for the wife, respect for the grandmothers that would live there from time to time. And then I never heard ever in my life any extended family member or my parents who had a disrespect for any kind of person, any style of person, any race of person. There was no bigotry, no prejudice, no gender bias. And I don't want to keep I want to keep that going. So I honor my parents, honor both my parents and my extended family of leaders. And I also honor the many wonderful leaders through the years who have formed, uh, helped to give light on God's word that help us with our doctrinal research. Even right now, different kinds of apostolic that means work birthing pioneers, oracle lampstands that light the way for us. And I thank you all. Thank you, fathers and mothers of prior generations coming down from Jesus Christ himself, the first true organic apostles, chief apostle. Uh, we want to get to some of our symbols, and I do want to you know, remind you that we are here up on the, in a symbolic fashion uh, at the leading of the Lord because of what we found. We keep finding in doctoral discoveries the lay of the land, which makes it very difficult to proceed with pioneering ministry. Our symbols are really homespun. We admit it. It could look better, and our, our production 
We do things non-typically because we've had to. Out where we moved, when we relo relocated here in the new area 10 years ago, I had never seen the chaos, the dysfunction, the poor family uh, of, and the, the misrepresentation of what ministry is at grassroots. It prohibited us. We couldn't find people that are stable still. And it's very hard. All Everyone's a chief. Everyone knows it all. They've never seen a woman, a white female, who does anything like this, a pioneering minister. And then I had been forced into an unwanted divorce, forced without any negotiation after being a faithful wife for 32 years, married in college, the only person. And I found that the bias toward even a grieving type widow who had followed from such, you know, if the believer, unbeliever wants to go, let them go. You must let them, even though it's not easy, it's really disrupt to your life. It ruins your life, potentially, without God. <clears throat> there was still bigotry, gender bias, like I'd ever, never seen. I never saw that in my family or extended family in ministry. I never saw that where I used to live. There was Levitical patriarchism now, you know, certain doctrines that would make it thou shalt not in certain groups more than others. But I never had to really perceive as a prophet, one of God's apostles and prophets, I thought, man, I never perceive on an area-wide regional basis the thick Western European Roman patricianism, legalism, Levitical law, and then the, um, the major patrician chauvinism, the up-and-coming achievement of Babylonian ministry. That's all I could think of can't go anywhere without being sort of pressured, highly pressured, aggressed even in certain couple of places that come to mind, to being a part of the system, the big religious system, whether it's a little house of God or a big house of God. And so then I under, understood why the Lord had led me to sort of perceive the lay of the land and why people are not going to church by the millions, even though there are many millions that do attend. But when you run the gamut, when you're led by the Spirit to find fellowship, you want to practice accountability, you want to increase your board in the mostly white charismatic uh, group, my heavens, females are looked down on. Maybe just white ones, I don't know, but it's like females should be seen and not heard. And then the ones that you will accept you as a person, you're looked down to think, you know, it's like you, instead of a peer, it's like, oh, look, they're coming to be under me. Oh, look, it's another female come to do my bidding, pay her tithe. Oh, good. And so the outer court gender bias, the outer court legalism, the, the doctrines mixed in with law, even though they have really great things like the Holy Spirit, good teaching, many good teaching, many good, much good music. You have to really wonder. If Jesus Christ, when he comes back on earth, who is he going to really say is a true Christ follower? When I was growing up, I remember, that, you know, it's different now. But when I was growing up, there was a calmness in our nation. There was a calmness in my family. There wasn't all this bullying, abuse, accuser, rape, murder, horrible things going on. And there was no politics mixed in with Christ following there was no bitter competition and rivalry at the local le level with the junior ministers and the, you know, uh, uh, you know, all this looking for, for faults and, you know, doctrines that have been raised up to keep an eye on overseer tabs, who's under and who's out from under legalism. Oh, uh, in the where I used to live, it was a very small region and landlocked. I'd come from a pastor's home where we had moved to Norfolk, Virginia. Where there was none of that, there was none of the, you know, keeping watch on everybody's business, and I hope you don't do that. But the idea I grew up first before that as a small child, we'd lived in a small town where my parents did not want to live in the parsonage near the church because we were always having to keep them busy.
out. And I got past the boundaries of, I don't think denominational people do that kind of thing, in my opinion. I'm submitting that to gossips and busybodies. Or Everybody these and cues on about being in a church, under covering, under submission to authority, and if they don't look like they are, we will not speak with them, we will not go over to them, we will not abide by and summarily submit to Matthew eighteen fifteen when uh, Matthew eighteen fifteen through seventeen, one to one upfront respectful, polite relationship preserving uh, community upfront conf confrontation instead no it is back to the law looking like a pharisee from afar keeping watch making sure they report to one another just like the pharisees did with jesus to see oh yes they're not part of the big ministry we're under we're, they're not part of our group our clan and so therefore it looks like maybe that's increasing while there is a falling away Falling away is based on a lot of things. Yes, there is a time when the Bible says there'll be a great apostasy, and that is in the land. But I think we would minimize it if we just watch our own P's and Q's ourselves and go through our own Bible and then read what is the difference between Old Testament law, where is covering and spiritual authority and fathering in the spiritual term that's being used in the New Testament. Read Matthew 23, Jesus' account. He says, don't call anybody father. There's only one father. The heavenly father is your father. When we look at the book of Paul, you know, Paul's writings, when we will look at that, look to the post-pre-Christian, very diverse Asia Minor community with all sorts of Gentiles and Jews and big issues of the region in a traveling, you know, trade route type thing, we don't find this setting ourselves up over everybody in the first church. We don't find it over Jesus appointing them. I think we all need to go back and really be real and get rid of our doctrines and read the Bible. Let's read the Bible and read it through the view of relationships. Read it how Jesus first modeled ministry. How did he model with his family, his mother, the real respect? How did he model with women and men and people who are in his own community of the the priests, and then the people out in the field and the multitudes with the lame and with the children, all age groups. How did Jesus model real respect with the sinner, the fallen woman, the fallen man, the, the people, the roving gathering demoniac? Did he have fear or did he have the power of his God, the power and might of the Holy Spirit upon him? Did he go about doing good or did he go about lecturing everybody and, you know, seeing if they were under the law and they kept all the jots and the dots and the tittles of the law and they, you know, performed and they achieved and they built their big mega ministry and their mega income based on, you know, working the principles of God. Now, we're, we're for faith. I am really for faith, but I believe in balance and I believe in protection of God's people but it's about, down in the grassroots, it's about what you see in the grassroots, out in the public, we're talking about, and we see, we need to see relationships, maturity, purity, pure in heart, fear of the Lord, discernment of people's boundaries, real respect for all kinds of people, not just for their clique, their clan, their group, or their color, and we are promoting now that the body of Christ, regionally, nationally, rise up past materialism, rise up past the book of the law, rise up past uh, our group's got to be right. I know more because I've read about brother so-and-so's, all his books or all her books. And, you know, our Bible does tell us that in the last days, knowledge will increase. I'm for knowledge. But it says also that knowledge puffs up. It makes proud. And we can see that as well. I know more. You know more. All right, whatever. 
Well, down in the ranks is where it rubber meets the road in ministry, where the relationships either prove that Jesus Christ is Lord or not. With real respect for all kinds of colors, all kinds of incomes, all kinds of people groups, whether they're Christian or not, whether they're leaders or not, whether they are never going to be a Christ follower or not. We are for real respect for all kinds of people without a spirit of religion. I think if we go around doing good like Jesus, it'll rub off and have an effect. If we work on our relationships, we go back and re examine our doctrine and say, do I need to be right or not? You know, Ephesians 2.19, it says to know that we are to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. So there is a place of information. There is a place of facts and knowing the hardcore logos and the books of the Bible and we memorize our scripture and we got good teaching but then there is a place past information into revelation into perception into discernment into real relationship with the most high God and the fear of the Lord and then going about like Jesus doing good when we teach today on we're talking a topic of of the many things that would make people not want to go near a church. We want to say, you know, if you look around us today, you might have a great church. You may know of thousands and thousands of wonderful churches, and they're doing well. We're like, that's great. But we want to look and see who's not there. I would say, who's not in the church? Well, they outnumber the church. And I'd really go back and look at the effective media, YouTube, Winds of Doctrine, the world, the flesh, and the devil, and then lack of love in the church, lack of fellowship, lack of knowing how to really relate to, to different kinds of people with real respect and make them feel treasured and valued and loved in Christian ministry. We could look and say, well, you know, it is no longer. It is no longer a seller's market. We can't just make our church all clean and nice and neat and be organized, tidy, and have great a relationship with those who come and those who, you know, if they look like us, if they say amen like we say amen in our group, if they wear their hair just right, we got to get past that. It's past that day. It is no longer the seller's market. We've got to lower ourselves a lot to think, you know, we don't know it all. No one will ever know it all. Who will know it all? Only the Lord. He is the revealer of secrets. And by this far, we have been given grace to know as much as we do, to stand it, to handle it, to know how to love God, to even have any glimpse of the fear of the Lord. When you look at the teeny little pictures on there, they're symbols of what we run into. Years ago, when I was 23, I'd been accepting the Lord at nine in my father's church during a revival. I repented and you know really made Jesus Lord when I was 16 or 17. And, and then when I went to college, I thought, you know, I'm going to experiment with what will happen. I want to know God's perfect will for my life, 17 or 18. Lord, I don't know what, you know, we're all learning and discovering all the time. I said, I don't know what you want, but I want your perfect will for my life, but I'm not going to have to know it all today. I want you to just, I'm going to experiment. What would happen if I let you lead me day by day, day by day, and grow and study and do whatever you want me to do day by day by faith? And that's all I've done. When I went to college and I was on the, you know, university and helped with the newsletter and bulletin boards. And then I went out to a meeting and met the Holy Spirit off campus at a Presbyterian church, charismatic church that was experiencing revival. And I'd always thought, uh oh, I don't want to get off base. I don't want to go into error. So I asked the Lord, Lord, if it is thy will that you give me a prayer language, I would like it. And it was never anything, I, I did get it when I was a junior, but it was never anything that knocked me off my field, uh, you know, knocked me over or took control. It was just a, a revelation. With me, it's always been a gentle, easy, oh yeah, now I see this, now I see that, a perception increase. And so even though I love that, I'm really careful, we're really careful in our ministry to promote non-dogmatic moving in the gifts. Nobody should feel ashamed. Nobody should feel less than whether they do or they don't. It makes people feel left out. It makes people feel confused and unloved. So we preach that the high standard for all relationships, including ourself with other ministries, with our family, and all ten relationships that are overlisted on online 
fellowship. Fo online fellowship. Us the page at the top ten Bible relationships which the Lord has given us. We say. It's So we have our little symbol up there about, see the one that says, you can hardly see it, says, do you refuse to accuse? Do I refuse to accuse? Do I refuse to accuse another leader, another person, another saint, another non-believer? Jesus didn't accuse anyone. He, he, he resembled his father who wouldn't even accuse Adam when he sinned. He said, Adam, where are you? Giving Adam a chance to rise up and be accountable. So Roman, excuse me, Revelation 12, 7 through 11 is a, is a missing doctrine. Because it says that after Jesus Christ came, the accuser was cast down and that we overcome him. Who's him? The accuser. By the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and we love not our life under death. We can think, well, why are people running away from church potentially? Because the accuser, the friendly fire out in the seats. When I have been sent, I, I didn't get back. Let me get to my story and digress a minute. When I made Jesus Lord in my life and asked for him to give, you know, lead me, and I wanted to see what would really happen in my life if I did that, an experiment. And then at 20, I received the Holy Spirit, which helped me in my discernment. Didn't know exactly what to do with it for a while, for a few years, till a few years later. But I increased in just walking it out with God. Uh, was a, Got married, was a young mother. And then one day when I was sitting, about 23 or 4, I was sitting in a Presbyterian charismatic church at the time. And I felt impressed of the Lord strongly. It was like out of the blue, because I'd always wondered why people don't get along. I thought, you know, growing up, I thought my parents were non-dogmatic. And back then, way back then, it was like Baptists and Christians, Baptists and uh, Catholics don't get along. You know, you don't you don't mingle with Catholics because of doctrine. I went, whoa, I never understood that. My parents didn't like it. I always had a Catholic best friend, everybody, boyfriends, everybody. It was just like, oh, I really thought back then that the Catholics and Baptists had an awful lot in common. They had the fear of the Lord. Sometimes they were terrified of him. <laughs> but anyway, so when my parents were growing up and I was prayed about where to go to church, it was never about their their brand. It was about are they good Catholics and they really know the Lord. human but it's like you go past that you just like think oh yeah I see the joy of the Lord I see the Holy Spirit on them I feel the anointing I think they're great teaching the great music right nice people respect 
females, a lot of the, most of them. So when we're looking for the body of Christ today and we think, well, is there a falling away? Is there a running away? We look at the issue of friendly fire. Where does friendly fire come from? It comes from people who are watching other people, Phariseeism and Old Testament Levitical law. Mix in with elevated pulpits, doctrines of the Nicolaitans, mixed in celebrity. You can see our little star, superstar at the bottom, symbol of the big eye, celebrity in ministry. And you look and you see the glasses on the picture of our symbol of the foggy discernment. Foggy discernment, low in discernment, Elahe priesthood, uh, jaundiced, older, maybe don't quite have their doctrine. They're trading on tradition or whatever, the world. So the idea is they don't really perceive organic. It's full of mixture. Then we have the picture of the symbol of the, of the you know, like that psychedelic look. That means the, the chemicals that are added in our world today and the, and the fault finding or the, really the types of drugs that are not organic, the way that people try their own contrived way to see God, false doctrine, false religion, doing it themselves, working people up by their own bootstraps, and then just the day we live in. So we want to go past, we want to look past the mixture, the faults, the fault finding, and let's go toward the truth. And once we find the truth, we'll be free, and maybe then we'll be able to be a representation that sets other people free without the condemnation, without resembling the accuser. It's no longer a seller's market. A seller's market means, oh yeah, all we do is, I want to sit here and look pretty. I'm going to look here. I don't want to be too goofy. It might offend somebody. You know what? I'm going to be looking out for the stereotyped white person or black person that I usually am sent to. I'm going to look out to the ones that look traditional like me or like a hippie like me. Whatever it is, we got to break that stereotype and we got to go out and say we're all equal. We're all potentially used by God, and now's the time to be more diverse and multicultural. Let's get past the legalism and the stigma of fear of man, a fear of people, of people-pleasing, human people-pleasing, and let's please God. Let's look about and say, you know, I know how teaching is for 50 years, 40 years, 30 years, watching the different movements progress from worship from the celebrity ministry back in the 80s when I started the ministry in public ministry, the fallout when the accusers started after Jim Baker and Jim Swaggart because people, God's people had wanted a king and had put people up on a celebrity and nobody told them not to. So when they fell, everybody was horrified and shocked because they thought nobody could do any wrong. And when, I, when that happened as a young minister... I went to the Lord and he gave me Micah 7, 5, which I'd never read Micah. And it says, do not put your confidence in your neighbor, not even in a guide. Do not put your confidence in the God, not even the one who lies beside you in bed. And I went, Lord, that's the secret. Let's just train everybody that sits under our ministry or, you know, wants to follow that they've got to hear God for themselves. And that I could, you know, it's warts and all with me. I'm just doing this by God's mercy. Like Paul said, Paul said, don't follow me, follow the Christ in me. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Know me, know my doctrine, know my lifestyle, know my patience, know my endurance, know my character when I'm not just preaching. He also said, don't ha uh, Peter said, let's don't have a respecter of persons of different kinds of people. Paul said, I, I've resolved to know nothing about anybody except Christ and them crucified. You can do that. You can improve and get past your outer court based discernment, your stereotyping, your Jezebel enthroning doctrine by going past that, which is human nature, to go past a bit of a more mature discerner, get the foggy glasses off in our picture. Get the false hype and stereotype off of the 
false religion, which is our our hippie symbol up there, the swirl. And let's get back down to the getting rid of the hoops of that man John Pearl's legalism. Oh, you can't do this if you're in our church because you're a woman. Oh, you can't do this because you you know you don't have the look we have because they're looking on the outer court based on training, based on upbringing, based on hype, based on the modern day appearance. And then let's get past the celebrity worship over on our star. Our picture of the fire of God, the fear of the Lord is there in our symbol of the flame. The picture of the eye of God, the picture of the unfolding mystery and revealer of secrets, the need to have more wisdom and revelation right now and to repent for being so strong-willed is right there in the eye of God, the symbolic, symbolic uh, sort of a style of an apostolic minister, a pioneering minister who goes to the Lord and they're going by faith. They have no clue how to get it done. He's got to reveal it like he did to the first church every single day. If you skip over to the right, there's the picture of the caveman. The caveman goes in and hears God in the prophetic cave like Elijah did when he went inside in 1 Kings 19, 9, and God spoke to him through the still small voice. It takes taking time apart, persisting to perceive the Lord. And we have a picture of the nations. God wants to cover the world with his love, with revelation, knowledge, uh, and his that he's the soon coming king, but we've got to ha understand that this is not the same old, same old. It's not going to be from now on. You've got to know your cultures. You've got to know how to minister to them, how to be loving to them, how to be direct. You can't just be old sweet baby Jesus, meek and mild, weak and, you know, mild. He grew up and he rose up and he became a, a man. We're going to get there later in our other topic. I've had an Arab friend God sent through my path, and it was quite amazing. Eye opener. I loved her, and I just got learned so much about the inside of God's other relatives coming down through Abraham, and how strong Jesus must have been because of their strength, and how Middle Eastern, not Middle European, Jesus Christ was organically how he thought through the Middle Eastern style of tribal of community. He went through community, not legalism, not Levitical patriarchism. He respected his all women. He treated people with respect, including Mary Magdalene, who had seven devils cast out of her, his own mother. There was no disrespect, no causing the woman to dummy down, be less than, because Jesus Christ wasn't a jerk, but he also wasn't under the law. We go back to the law and we think, well, where did the law start? The law started which talked about all these gender roles and things of that nature to preserve society back in Old Testament. Prior to that, there was when there was no curse, no fallen humankind, nobody ever acted out. Nobody had to be, you know, it was, they were discerning and perceiving God communicating with the Lord organically, and therefore when God made Adam and Eve, he made them equal. Look at Genesis 1. However, there's chain of command. When the curse was put on there, it was the curse for the woman. It was the curse for the man about the sweat of the brow. Well, people are always talking against, let's, you know, God has removed the curse when Jesus came. He removed the curse of the sweat of the brow. Let's have our faith to receive some supply from the Lord, income from the Lord. Well, I think you can have your faith for that, that the woman is not under the curse of the law either. She doesn't have to be controlled by the husband. And yet, on the other hand, woman, you don't want to control him back. You don't want to control either. So we are back to Ephesians 5.21 on that mutual, mutual submission in the fear of the Lord. Maybe if we work on our relationships, maybe we work on our relationships and we model organic Christ following, that would open the hearts of many people who would no longer have said, I, I don't want to go to any church again. They're just a bunch of bigots. They're a bunch of pious hypocrites. They're so religious, they care about their form and their worship style, but they don't care about me. We look toward the Lord. We look toward being mature. We look toward doctrines that are not included in most services about relationships. 
about the fear of the Lord. If you look at the missing, some of the missing concepts which involve relationships, you'd have to go back with and to James 3.17 as a criteria for long-term relationships. Long-term enduring love, how you get along, how you train people in a fellowship. Yes, people will want to come. People can try to come, but if you want them to stick it out year in, year out, month in and month out, you're going to have to have better relationships rather than law. We have the online church for many reasons. One is we couldn't find enough people because of the pitiful doctrine fruit out in the stands. We like, listen, they're great teachers. We're not saying this is against any apostles or great people of who've got big work. It's the fruit of mixture that one runs into as a newbie, pioneer in the work, can't find people that show up, can't find people that are Spirit, this honest, free, uh, and then did it. So this isn't everywhere, but it made me realize that in a percentage wise in certain parts of the nation, listen, it's the Babylonian ministry that produced this. So we're looking at what is a Babylonian ministry. Well, it's got a format. It looks the part, but it doesn't produce organic. It produces mixture, legalism, lack of love, and it's super busy. Therefore, it has no relationship with the Lord itself. It doesn't have time to park itself with the Lord, and there's no fresh manna. It just comes down from passed down teaching tapes and from other moves and other famous ministers. And that didn't mean they're wrong. I'm not about the famous ministers. No, I listen to a lot of those myself. But it's how I handle it. Do I want to be holy? Do I want to be spiritually? Those are symbols of the styles of churches. It takes discernment of Christ's body, who are heroes and who are not. But you cannot go by the style or the form these days. You cannot go by their look or their dress or even their size. We have a picture on there, if you can see that little picture. We have the right-hand side. It's the staid, sturdy, mega ministry. It's proven. People look up to it. They're responsible, all right? So they have to have some energy in there. They have to have downloaded revelation to get that far, but then they have to not turn into a bureaucracy or religious system. So those people have to have organization, have to have interest, infrastructure to grow and be organized. We're not against that. We're for it, but it's just without legalism. And then down at the bottom level, you have to know that those people are not well-trained and many people there. In fact, that's one reason we have the online church. I was, there are too few people who are discerning of how to treat a female minister who, how, who could not see one without barking orders or being completely clueless and really immature in the fact that That is the symbol of the pioneering church on the front lines of the last week. Maybe up to 350, 250, and smaller. It's a lot smaller. So those people are brave. They're sticking their neck out. That's why their neck is so high. That's why we have the tall when they stuck their neck out for the Lord. The only part is it is so tough. It can get so tough in realistic grassroots that they could get hard hearted or stiff necked if they're not careful. So we need to make sure that we don't get overly 
inspired, that we don't sort of overly, uh, you know, make time away or do things that are fun and play so that you can keep your, your, your soft heart in it. Okay. The bottom one is the exotic land. Again, it doesn't mean that it has to go like that. There's an international thing. <laughs> trying to be, but it, you're more flowy, maybe eclectic, servant leader, maybe not servant leader, but those kinds are basically the three kinds of Santa Claus. I guess, or something, or they respect women, or they respect, they're not afraid of women, you know, because they respect more women are strong in their communities. I don't know what it is, but then there's some groups that, that you go in there and they are scared. You can tell they're scared and it's white. <laughs> it's pitiful. I mean, it's so sad. We want to rise up. We want to mature. up. Then you can also tell that some people have really do not like their mother. They must really resent women because they've met people like that look like me or look like certain kinds or they've had the you know fear of witches and fear that's charismatic you know i've never had a baptist or a methodist or a black or white do anything like that but no black people ever do this there are no black people that ever are afraid of witches i think they've grown up having to be strong and they have the spirit of power and might on them most of them I don't think they feel like that. They just know they're God. So we need to balance that out. We need to make sure that if somebody comes that's atypical, that shows up, a stranger, that you don't go send your witch watchers out. I've had that happen at certain kind of groups a couple of times. It's so discouraging. I'm a, I'm a mature prophet. I'm an, I don't have to have anybody call me that. But I'm saying I know the Lord. I know the body. I know the spirit of the Lord. And I know people, God's people. There is no need to have some immature person come up where I, I mean, I went, <laughs> it was like they say, who are you? This is how they do it. One person did it this way. Young woman, well-intentioned, thinking that nobody knew anything about the Lord or the Holy Spirit except them. That's the pride. And they go up and you, you here you are wanting to hear God. You're there because your husband's left and you're exhausted. You're grieving. You're, you loved him, you know, and you didn't have any. It wasn't your say and you're cr trying to get healing from the Holy Spirit. So you go sit in a group to, to worship and they instead single you out and they send their witch watchers over and they look at you and they say, well, who are you? Why are you here? Just like that. And I go, 
Oh, my stars, is there no break from this relentless spirit of religion? So we just say, let's lighten up. My heavens, that makes Jesus' house accusational. That makes Jesus' house look, people are scared. And so we look back at our picture of the fire on our symbol here, and we say, well, where is the picture of Isaiah 11, 2, and 3? The Messiah who is filled with all of God's seven spirits, the Holy Spirits, and yet he didn't want to control. He didn't feel like he needed to control everybody that came on his property. All right? Where are the seven spirits of God in every lampstand, including yours and mine? Where are they, Lord? And what are the seven spirits of God? They're the same ones that were represented in the book of Acts, Holy Spirit Dunamis, but they were wrapped up inside the ministry leader of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, on Isaiah 11, 2. And it says they're the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of power, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. I mean, real understanding, real knowledge, real Holy Spirit, might, and power. Where is that now? And so if you have somebody who is not afraid, who's their own person, whether they're a Christian or not, they're going to come in there if they're Jewish or Muslim or, or gay or somebody. They're going to go in there and thinking, you know what, I'm going to check out these Christ followers. I'm going to see what they're really like. But if you have a bigoted fear, a biased gender bias, or a put-upon predisposition, Position to look for sin, be a sin spire ministry, and look for who's out from order, and who just because you are proud. Trade route, pre-Christian, no Bible, no prior generation of generations of teachers to pick their brains or get their teaching books to see how to handle things. Here Paul comes in and he ministers to the church of Ephesus, this little organic offspring but he never sets up overseer watchers. He never sets up accusers. He never sets up sin spires or, or Jezebel spires because he wasn't afraid. They had the power of might on them. They had the power of might. They didn't think it was a seller's market. Oh, yeah, we are so good. We are so pure. We are so righteous that we don't need to advertise. We don't need to be any better. They need to come to us. We're like a magnet. No, they got out there. They mingled and they mixed and they went out in the mixture and they went about doing good. However, it took a servant leader heart. It took a know-how from the Holy Spirit and insight because that was the beginning of all things pioneering ministry, but it took also boldness, the power of God's might, God's holy seven spirits in the three in one, you know what I mean? The, the, the book of Acts. So the church fed on the Holy Spirit, the church, whether you believe in talking or tongues, you can, you know, we're for it, but that's your, you know, we're not trying to get you off on that. We want you to have power and might. He can deal with you and give you tongues later. But the idea is let's get the power and might. It is wuss city and it's tension city. Who wants to go where it's tension city, where you think you're going to scare some weak minister by showing up at their church unexpectedly? I thought, man, if they're scared of a white woman, some of these <laughs> few, it's pitiful because that shows how timid and lacking in the real 
concept that we are overcomers, that Jesus Christ came and he won the victory. He won the victory over our land. He won the victory over our... We're seated in heavenly places with him. It also shows people have a fear of other people, fear of humans, fear of women brings a snare just like it does a fear of men. Respecter of persons and a fear of certain kinds of persons will cause you to look weak. And you have to rise up and be and know how to handle it because if you show that you're afraid or you act like you're upset or give them that old blank weak stare instead of walking over and saying hi and being up front like a peer has come your way, then that will look down on Jesus Christ house following. It will make Jesus Christ look disrespectful because people think, oh, you know, is that how all Christians are? It must be. I don't want any more to do with that. When I was led by the body around the body of Christ for 30 years it, or more, it was like I was never led, even though I had my own ministry, was on media and things in the East Coast, and I had offices, and it was very small. But I'd be sent out across the nation, down to Florida, down to North Carolina, up to Pennsylvania, uh, different places, Oklahoma, from time to time, now the Deep South. And when I did, it would be on a mission, like a mission trip or to speak and or to speak and then I'd be led of the spirit and I'd find out oh look God is showing me people God's people who've started movements or worship founts or uh, outpouring sometimes or prayer movements or just different parts of the body I never knew existed the charismatic part the real Pentecostal part the worship part the glory kind whatever black uh, and it was so in interesting because I looked through the eyes of Paul. I looked through the eyes of Jesus to said who these people are from the inside out. And then you notice the culture that they come wrapped in as well. So we are for Christ's body. We are for you. We're just not for things that put down other people. And God uses me, I guess, as some kind of litmus test in the white community. The black community, it doesn't seem as needed one from, you know, from whatever my kind is. But in the white community, you can really tell the Jezebel hunting crowd. Man, that is so unloving. And you can really tell the people who need to be worshipped. They feel the need to be worshipped in their pulpit. That is so bad. It's so bad that Jesus is the only one. If anything for this scripture, if anything I'd say for this ministry video today, this word on this topic would be apostolic apostolic word that says I have been crucified Paul writes I have been crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I but Christ who lives in me it is not I who live but Christ who lives in me the apostolic word see the word crucified if you would examine what crucified was it was agony I've been through agony for the Lord I've been to, through shipwreck. I have been people through people gossiping about me and ruining my name and putting me down when my husband left me, right, accusing me of all sorts of stuff and torturing me. And, and those were the, just the Christians. <laughs> and you think, Paul wrote, I've been crucified with Christ. I was shipwrecked. I was going through all these things. But... Nevertheless, I live. He spared me. He gave me rejoicing. He trained me in the middle of it all. Gave me times to hang out in fellowship with the suffering, in the fellowship of his sufferings with the Lord. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, by this time, after all those twists and turns, not I, but Christ who lives within me. I have the joy of the Lord. I have the power of the Lord. I have the might of the Lord. I have the peace of God. I have the restoration joy of the Lord. I have the perspective of victory of the Lord. I have no sin in the camp in the Lord. I am just full of joy. Jesus joy. Yet, when you look about for fellowship to be equally yoked in these body of Christ, in these days, and you're not famous, not up in the famous crowd. No, no, no. You're out in the ranks and the stands as a visitor, as a new person, as a female or a male. You run into the cast of characters who say they are Christians. 
who say they are ministers, who say they represent Christ, and you do not know what you are going to find. You're going to find legalism, stereotyping, ministry stereotyping, glad-handing, not true because after a while they'll take advantage, they'll take your stuff. So the idea is when I moved, I had never... Nobody has disrespected me. Nobody has treated me with anything but great respect. And I've had a lot of fun. One reason the kinds I choose to hang around with, the kind that chose to hang around with, with me, they love the Lord. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were filled with the joy of the Lord. They were filled with the power of God's might. This wasn't wimp ministry. Jesus Christ wasn't into wimp ministry. All right? Now, there are people that are soft-spoken. I am pretty soft-spoken. But when I get into the power of the Lord, the message of the Lord, he comes upon me. But I'm also pretty much fun. I don't do this all the time. I'm pretty much trying to be natural so that I can be organic as a human being who happens to love Jesus when I'm out at the grocery store, when I'm buying things, when I'm uh, interacting with people. Working out, I try to be just the real deal because nobody should be any different. If anything, I would promote the grassroots move of God as leadership, as just being yourself. I would promote the grassroots move of God as just being a relationship ministry where it's not you who lives, but Christ within you at all times. I told about my mother's friend, June, who just went to be the Lord a couple of years ago. Her husband did this year. They were millionaires, multimillionaires, but I never had met a multimillionaire when they were alive, but they walk the walk and talk the talk behind the scenes. Nobody knew they were millionaires. They didn't act like it. They were loving when she shopped. She was so, I remember June being so respectful. She looked great at her age, dressed to the nines, but low king, you know, servant leader, humble. But she respected totally every single person she bought makeup from or, or went out to the restaurant. So did he. And people loved them. People respected them. And they were leaders, but the, and they were at the top of their top leaders. But they were just like you and me. They were, they were very non-famous but approachable servant leaders and they were organic Christians who happened to be Presbyterians so we're for the body we're for the national body of Christ but we're saying these days we better look at our product we better look at our act we better look and see who we really are and who we really are not and then say why are we bothering why are we busy with this thing called ministry if it's plastic if it's phony if it's misrepresenting Jesus Christ himself who walked about doing good in an humble servant fashion. I thought of this, and this is not to be insulting. I think people who are doing a great work, there are Solomons and mega ministry. And there are people who want to be Solomon and mega ministry, and they're, they're not up there yet, and I have to deal with them. That's why I'm online. The Boanerge crowd. The surge of Boanerges has been that are affected by media. The winds of doctrine, YouTube fame, aggressive, those are the ones that started me really needing to have this place of, you know, like of peace apart from the ego, bucking with up to the egos that are, you know, lacking in discernment, lacking in maturity, and lacking in love. And I thought of, you know, if you have the word organic, and then you have the word plastic in Christ following, in ministry, in fivefold office. Then what's going on? It must be something. If this mixture's out there in the seats that big, 
and the religious system is so huge, then what, and it's like ministry Babylon, you don't know who's true and who's false. And the celebrity follower crowds are there, dependent crowds, celebrity dependent ministry. Then you think, well, therefore the grace of God go we all. But also you think, well, why do you want a fellowship? Why do you want a fellowship with, with mixture? Why do you want to go when people are undiscerning and low of functioning in the fact that they're not respectful? I think it bodes on doctrine. When I found people ripping me off when I was a new person, having lost my husband, uh, trusted people that said they were Christians, they ripped off the ministry piano and stuff like that, uh, new computer and all those things at different times, different kind of groups of Christians that quoted the, quoted the talk, talked in tongues, you think, whoa, whoa, I never met a Baptist who did that. I never met a, whoa, what's in the doctrine? What is in the doctrine that is that entitled? So if you go confront, then they avoid being confronted. You go, whoa, where is Matthew 15, 18? They're not yielded to God's whole counsel. And then you look at when if a Christian who says they're your peer or your helper or the person who's a pastor is behaving at grassroots level, that lowly, that pitiful, that shabbily, you think, well, what's in their doctrine? And then what is in all the doctrine that allows this to continue? What is missing? So we looked at the relationships. That's when we realized it isn't about the thievery. It's not about, it's about the disrespect. When people gossip and avoid being confronted or they will not practice confrontation, but they instead judge people, accuse people from a foreign leadership, such as goes on in our nation a lot, you think, what's the root of this? It's not the sin. It's the lack of love. It's the lack of relationship, respect for all kinds of people. So our ministries devised this new... Because, and when I did it with the Christians, I never had any... I dealt with non-Christians a lot. It was more like living in the church of Ephesus. It's very multicultural out here, more than I'd ever seen. But I never had anybody that was a non-Christian rip me off, be rude to me, be gender biased that I know of. I was looking, because I'm sent to the body of Christ in a national sense, I was looking at the fruit of the Christ followers. And I was thinking, no wonder. It's not just a falling away it's a running away from that kind of twisted fruit, weird doctrine. And I'm going to look at the doctrine and see what it is so we can at least teach on what's doctrine, whether they receive it or not, whether they receive me or not. When I couldn't find any helpers that, would, that actually represented the Christ, showed up, were, not, were really who they said they were, were really orderly and showed up on time, respectful, honest and could not find them after eight tries back in 2012 the lord removed me from the grassroots because he said it is just depleting you physically but also wearing me down but also financially and he said you're just seeing what i see it's not about you personally don't take it personally it is about what i see in this region what is allowed to go on what is needing in doctrinal change, but also in family. It go back. It went back to how people are raised, how they're raised with legalism, how they're raised with respect for relationships, how they're raised with or without the fear of the Lord, how they were raised with respect for women, their own mothers, with leaders, whether there's bias. And the Lord just put them a heart. There for the grace of God go we all, but we need to come up with a plan to work on that. And that doesn't include hate speech. This doesn't include putting down any non-Christian because I didn't, I'm not talking about anything I found in the non-Christian community. That's their deal. I'm talking about what the lay of the land is in this deal, the Christ, Christian following community. You can have mixture and you can call yourself a great and mighty lampstand. But you know what? If you look at how... The food in America, the food in America and the wheat has gotten additives in it. And there's hormones in the meat and the corn is not your mama's corn, your grandmother's corn. It's got all these additives and hormones in it that make people gain weight. 
Well, you can look at Monsanto, who owns all the food now, the food production, and you can think a mega, uh, if there is a good mega ministry, we're for it. But you can see how mega doctrine from all sorts of national, international pulpits on media can come down and corner the market because everybody wants a king. Everybody's trained, yeah, let's look up. Let's don't think for ourselves in ministry. Yeah, let's pander down and, and cease to look at the relationship effects of the doctrine. Let's cease to uh, certain scriptures that aren't we won't. We'll just ignore the ones that say, count your own salvation. We'll put that by the wayside. We're going to look. If we want a king, we want to be lifted up ourselves, so we're going to say the good man knows the road and how to do it. And we're going to avoid a king. We're going to avoid the children of God. 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 And when you run into that fruit of what is supposed to be Christian, Christ-following, organic doctrine, you think, what is being fed? And we think we better move out. The Bible teaches us that there are last days falling away. We believe there's a last day running away, but we need to know why, and we're investigating it. And we're looking at 2 Timothy 5, 1 through, through 5. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. From a Christian-only leadership lampstand point of view. I never thought, it, it never occurred to me until God revealed it three years ago, that now that church, the, the, the 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5 command, men and women will be in the last days, men and women will be lovers in the cells, accusers, boasters, dishonest, disrespectful, from such turn away. I never thought it would be ministers. So from the point of view of the state of the onion, I think we've got a lot to do. We've got a lot more to do than meets the eye. From such turn away, fellowships are out there. 1 Timothy 6, 6, another from such turn away fellowship. If they think, if they equate, if the men and women who teach equate having big money with God's, a sign of God's blessing from such turn away. I'm not against having faith for finances. I believe finances are between you and the Lord. And we encourage you to have faith in finances and renew your mind and work the word, whatever he says, or worship or prayer or just hard work. Whatever God says, that's not my deal. It is how the motives of relationships are in the process, how mature you are, what your perspective is, that we're really here for a short time in ministry and on this earth, and that we need the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom. Without the fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of wisdom, then we have exactly what we need. We have now in certain places, not everywhere. We have the beginning of what? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Well, then the lack of the fear of the Lord, the minus of the fear of the Lord in ministry is the beginning of what? So to make a long service short, we're just going to submit this to you as a sila, and we're going to continue on with the next part. But before I do, I want to mention how Paul, Apostle Paul, had no fear, no qualms about men or women, or leaders or lay, or young or old, when he worked in the fields which were ripe for harvest in the church of Ephesus in Ephesians. Every one of his relationships is based on power of God, might of God, knowledge of God, the secret place with revelation. Yes, we know in verse chapter 1, uh-oh, we're having a little thing here. Yes, we know that, uh, yes, we know that Paul taught to the diverse multitudes of Greeks, of Hebrews, Romans, Scythians, you name it, and that he looked at everyone as equal. 
and that he looked at everyone as a potential to have God's life in them and power. So there was no bigotry. There was no elevated pulpit in Paul. He wrote the opposite if we study how Paul wants us to get along. I'm going to have to close. There's something maybe going on with our recording here, but I'm going to keep up. In fact, next week I might talk. I'm going to do another one today, of course. I've got a lot more to say, but I'm going to keep on for this. But it's relationships that are the real deal that matters. Ephesians 2.14 comes to mind. He is our peace, who's broken down every wall of partition to make us both one. Back then it was the Jews versus all the rest, which are Gentiles, being Greeks and Romans and all these different kinds. But through Jesus Christ, our cornerstone, we can find common denominations, denominational things to get on, cross-denomination. Ephesians 4, Paul writes, he teaches the church a command. He says, you all get along in meekness and lowliness and long suffering with one another. Find common doctrine that you identify all you apostles. And he names the fivefold offices in that chapter. Find the common doctrine, which are the following one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, the father of us all. And then everything else you decide by working out your own salvation what time of day you meet, what you believe about males and females, spiritual authority and covering, whether you, uh, what you believe about divorce, what you believe about your, your place of meeting, your day of meeting, and your service style, your music, etc. So we have to do that. We're not doing that. We're not teaching that. The common doctrine, once it's yielded to, submitted to by the fivefold offices, which we think, Paul wrote on purpose, lowercase capital, instead of capital letters, when he names the, the book, chapter 4 in Ephesians, apostle, prophet, pastor, evangelist, teacher. I believe he wrote that to make sure that they were servant leaders out with the sheep. When, that, when they yield to that, when we yield to that, all of us, cross-racial, cross-body, then we'll have the fruit that remains that is also given in Ephesians 4. And you may read that for yourself that said there'll be less winds of doctrine, less legalism, less immaturity, less people tossed to and fro, and less fraud in the body. The people will grow up and reflect the true Christ, the true faith in Christ, but it will affect and transform the community. And let's ask, are our communities transformed right now? And if so, thank you. Where's the church? If not, let's look for it. Let's find our doctrine. Let's identify the common doctrine. And then also let's work out no racism. If you have a ministry that you teach people to, to forgive, no matter what people did to your race, or they held them slaves, or they set them free, where they abused you, accused you, lied to you, do you wrong, family feuds, pet peeves, then God will forgive you. He'll forgive them. But if you hope, allow people not to forgive in your ministry, God's going to hold you responsible. So we need to go back and say, God, is there anything I'm not doing? Omission. Is there anything I am doing? Commission. Is there anything God would be happy with and organic and he's pleased right now? Celebration. So let's go for that. We'd really celebrate. This is Dr. Tavo, D, Tavo DRC signing off for now with a leadership exhortation. And we're going to have part two of 2016 State of the Onion, peeling back a few levels and layers to see what's really underneath. Following. God bless you. Bye-bye.